It is that time, our Rush Hour Roundtable. And for the first time today, we are also streaming live on NewsNationNow.com and our NewsNation Facebook page. So, of course, we do want to introduce you to today's panel. We have, of course, News Nation's Ashley Banfield, host of Banfield. Jason Hammer, co-host of the morning radio show Hammer and Nigel on 93.1 WIBC in Indianapolis. Capri Cafaro, the former minority leader of the Ohio State Senate and the host of the Eat Your Heartland Out podcast and radio show. And Mark Lamont Hill, author, TV host of BET News and Al Jazeera up front, as well as a professor at Temple University. All right, panel, welcome. And we want to get right to our first topic. Scientists around the world following a rare and unusual virus called monkeypox. The U.S. reporting its first case this week in Massachusetts. Health officials, though, keeping an eye on a possible case in New York City. The CDC has been tracking cases in several countries that don't normally report monkeypox. And now the U.S. has ordered more than $100 million worth of a vaccine protecting against monkeypox. Now, just to compare, the CDC spent more than $20 billion in COVID vaccine preps and distribution just last year. But our big question, now that we are in year three of the COVID pandemic and all of the back and forth that those three years have entailed, has the CDC lost your trust? Is the agency still credible when it comes to other potential health crises? Ashley, let's start with you. No, <laughs> I, I haven't lost my faith in, in the CDC. I have lost more faith in the people uh, in the press talking politically about medicine than I have about the CDC. And I also, I got to say one thing. I hope someone on this panel can help me, but uh, I watched one cable news channel that said there's no cure, no treatment. Um, and then I saw in the New York Times, oh, you can get a viral uh, treatment. And now I have no idea if I get monkeypox, if I can actually get fixed. Panel? Well, I do, I do know that there's uh, what they're using for this vaccine. Apparently, that there's a smallpox vaccine. I don't know. Obviously, I don't know if that's going to be a treatment or if it's more prophylactic. But um, this smallpox vaccine is 85% effective against monkeypox. So that is at least something. And I'm glad to see that the CDC and the American government is being proactive by actually ordering a vaccine that they know can actually work. I would say, you know, I also have not lost faith in the CDC. I do think that things have become incredibly politicized, which I think has made a lot of the American public second guess, um, you know, the CDC and, and other health officials. But in the United States, Massachusetts actually um, is where they're tracking it. They have their own local and state health officials. So not everyone in the chain of command that deals with, uh, you know, viruses and epidemiology is somehow corrupt or wrong. I mean, this is all over the world now. Frankly, I'm more scared than anything else. It's a little freaky. Yeah. <laughs> I think for me, it, the question of trust is an interesting one. I don't believe that the CDC uh, should not be trusted in the sense that I think they're doing something dishonest. I think we learned two things during this COVID-19 pandemic. One, as Ashley pointed to, is that this is an incredibly political uh, climate when we talk about illness and disease and viruses, that it's not just let's find the science, let's get the medicine and let's fix it. People have a vested political interest in certain outcomes and in certain analysis. And the other thing is doctors don't like to say they don't know and neither do scientists. And so I think the CDC always gave us its best information. We were told that, you know, at one, at one point we thought that if we got the vaccine, we'd be fine and we couldn't pass it to other people. We thought there was a 90% chance or a 95% chance we'd be okay. You know, we, we thought that we could, you know, there are all these uh, the bar kept moving, but I don't think anyone was being dishonest. I think the more information we got, the more we learned about different strands, the more the, the knowledge changed. So I trust the CD the same amount, but I think we're a lot less uh, wide-eyed uh, and naive about how science and medicines work when we're trying to unpack a crisis in real time. But most illnesses, most diseases, most viruses, the CDC understands and knows, and if they have the answer, I believe them. All right, Hamill, what do you think? Yeah agree on here is that it's become political, right? That's the one thing I think we can all agree on here. And maybe we're singling out the CDC a little too unfairly here, because the word I want to focus on is experts. Nobody has had a rougher two and a half to three years than experts, right? Whether it's been the Surgeon General Jerome Adams, whether it's been Dr. Fauci, whether it's been folks talking about the vaccine, the experts that have been rolled out to the media networks have been wrong a lot. And it doesn't make you a bad person for pointing out that, wait a minute, didn't Dr. Fauci say, don't wear a mask? 
Then he said to wear one. Didn't Jerome Adams say the same thing? I was told that the vaccine, if I got it, I wouldn't get coronavirus. I couldn't spread it. Turned out not to be true. Experts have had a rough two and a half to three years. And while it may be unfair to single out the CDC, I don't think people have lost complete faith, but I think people are more ready to take a pause before they're ready to believe an expert on anything, especially after the last couple of years. All right, I want to interject See, I, two things here really quickly. I, I, Ashley, I want to answer your question. On the CDC's website, it says there is no proven safe treatment for smallpox, or excuse me, for monkeypox, but when it comes to prevention, there is that smallpox vaccine. And I don't know, is our panel uh, maybe just very forgiving? Because we do have a News Nation poll that says when it comes to information about COVID-19, which of the following sources would you say you trust? Fewer than 50% trust federal health authorities like the CDC, like the FDA. So what do these agencies need to do to try to fix their reputation? I think it's a lot of conflation too, right, Nicole? People are conflating federal authorities. I mean, for heaven's sake, our top federal authority told us we should inject bleach, bleach. under our skin or something. I don't even remember. It was just all so horrendous. So I think, look, I, honestly, I really think what Jason says is important, and that is that there, the intentions of the experts and of the government are usually pretty darn good. And when we are faced with something we've never been faced with before, sure, there'll be a learning curve. But I think the purveyors of the information stink. And I think their and intentions that is why nobody need to be watched. the CDC. And I think that is the general consensus that I'm hearing for the panel is that, you know, it's not that we're necessarily so forgiving. I think we're all saying that, you know, there are some issues with how this information is being conveyed. And I think what's happening amongst the American public is that that the way that they're receiving or getting that information communicated to them is leading to some kind of mistrust um, with the CDC or any other maybe federal agency. What I find kind of ridiculous, and maybe others do too, is somehow we're not trusting, there are Americans that are not trusting the CDC or other federal agencies, yet they trust their neighbor or some dude on Facebook that, you know, shared some meme and all of a sudden they're an expert and not the experts that went to medical school or, or have, you know, a advanced degrees. So I don't know how you balance those two things of you don't trust experts that actually have a background, but you trust some random stuff you heard on the internet. I don't know. One thing that Mark said that I thought was spot on here was that the experts at the very beginning, they wanted to make it look like they had all the answers. And this was a pandemic. This was a thing that we had never experienced before. We're naive. We took their word for it. Instead of coming out and being completely transparent and saying, listen, we're not really sure about this. We've got questions. This is what we know right now, but that could change. We didn't get that a lot at the very beginning. We got masks work, masks don't work, vaccines work, vaccines don't work. It was so convoluted. I think a lot of people did indeed kind of say, you know what, I'm better off just doing the research by myself at this point. Yeah, and even though that research is not necessarily correct. Mark, were you gonna add something? Yeah, yeah, I, I was, I was going to say, yeah, that the doing the research yourself is part of the problem. And the reason why this continues uh, is because we live in a climate where people can't say we made a mistake. Politicians can't say, I changed my mind. They say, oh, you're a flip-flopper. Before you said you were against this, and now you say you're for it. I was like, yeah, I got more information. I got smarter. I changed my mind and make a more informed decision. But our political climate is so invested in saying, gotcha, that you can't do that. So a scientist yeah. can't say, hey, I thought you should wear them. I, I thought masks didn't matter until I found out this N95 study shows, hey, an N95 mask might matter way more than this dental hygienist mask that we're just playing games with. But the problem is you can't say that because then you look like you are a failure because you actually had the courage to move forward and say, hey, I got more info. But people have their businesses shut down because of that. I think that's a deal breaker. That's a big deal. People's lives, in some cases, were shut down and ultimately ruined because of this information that was coming out that these experts didn't know 100% what was going on. Small business owners were told you have to lock down, you have to do this. A lot of them never recovered, and I think that's a shame. You know, Doesn't this just tell you, though, guys, that that information is king and that everybody out there who has now decided to weaponize it and do exactly what Mark just said, use gotcha politics and gotcha journalism, and I'm going to be a big star at 10 o'clock at night because I can scream at one side with histrionics, that stuff kills people, shuts businesses down, and creates mm -hmm. havoc in society. If everybody could just chill the heck out and be honest and authentic, what a difference uh, we would be. I, I believe that's the way we were about 30 years ago.
Well, you know, what's interesting is there is a CDC report uh, from back in 2014, obviously pre-pandemic, pre all of this, that it was titled, entitled, Keeping the Public's Trust, and said keys to success include transparency and communication. So it's interesting. Fast yep. forward to 2020, oh, 2021, 2030. Exactly. Those were the days of uh, panel. Yeah, I, that probably was actually during the Ebola issue in 2014. I bet that there's probably a connection there. Yeah, you know, and handled very differently. Also a very different reaction. Also, you know, very different uh, number of people impacted. All right, panel, great discussion. We are going to take a break. We're going to come back and discuss Happy the Elephant. Oh, welcome back. Well, it is Friday, so of course that means we are in the middle of the Rush Hour Roundtable. We want to talk now about a bizarre case 
out of New York City. This is in court. Uh, this week, a hearing to determine the future of Happy the Elephant. She currently lives at the Bronx Zoo. She's been there 45 years. Critics argue Happy the Elephant should be treated under the law as a person. Animal rights activists say she is being mistreated. Zoo officials say she is not. The big question here, are people, or excuse me, are animals people too? Hammer, you start us out on this one. Maybe this is just the way that my mind works, but the first thing that I thought of is whose trial, whose case is not being heard because we're trying to figure out if Happy is a person. Is there somebody's case where like a crackhead attacked somebody that's not being heard because we're trying to figure out if animals are people too? This is a ridiculous thing to me, and maybe I'm the lone ranger here, but what are we going to get if we find out animals are people too? Is the elephant going to put on a little elephant suit, go down to the bank with his settlement check, and deposit it? Oh, no. Oh, look at you. Look at you. Uh, Jason, mm, I thought the same thing. I thought the same thing. What case isn't being heard while a judge is determining if corporations are people? Thank you. Oh, Ashley. <laughs> But that was argument, exactly all I was thinking at this whole thing was corporations are not people and neither are, are animals. I mean, this is totally ridiculous. I mean, you know, you have to ask yourself the, the question that, you know, are, did the, did the elephant somehow, you know, if it were a person, did it call up and say, look, I'm being mistreated at the Bronx Zoo. I would like legal representation. So will someone please take this case because I'm, you know, being ill-treated? There are laws on the books that exist for animal maltreatment, for animal protection. We all love animals. We certainly want elephants to live. I would bet that the Bronx Zoo also agrees. Happy probably is living up to his or her name, being happy there for the last 45 nah. years. No, no, no. Happy's depressed. No. Happy is alone and Happy's Happy in is one depressed. acre. Happy's not even allowed to see the other yeah. elephant because Happy's lived in isolation for 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Happy's yeah. lived Happy's in isolation for 10 does, years. Does so Happy we know Happy is not happy. Trait? Happy's absolutely not happy. I think there are a couple of issues here. And, and, and first, I, I begin by saying, yeah, no, this, to me, the answer to this is somewhat axiomatic. It is self evident. Mm. That's very impressive, not, Mark. Professor. Animals. Professor. Animals. He plays animals Wordle, not, too. People, right? And actually, I still can't figure out how to get to Wordle. I'm an old man now. I don't even know how to do it. But an animals are not people because animals are, um, just hear me out, animals, right? That, so, so I think that we can, we can begin from that place. However, I think there are legitimate questions that we can ask about animal safety, about animal rights. And part of the problem is because we're so selfish or even so solipsistic as human beings that we can't see outside of ourselves. And so the only framework we have for thinking that anybody deserves decency and safety and love and care is to see them as humans. So to that extent, I understand why someone would use that argument. But the problem with that argument then is that you get to a case where we're not just talking about does this animal deserve to be locked in a cage? Does, should this animal be skinned alive or should this animal be eaten? The kinds of ethical questions we're always asking, but we're now asking if this animal should get a cut from a selfie. And, and those are the you know things what? that are- Well, that, that's and interesting, that's yeah, I'm because there was a case, too. yes. Yeah, there was a, a monkey but in the, Indonesia that took a picture of itself uh, using a wildlife photographer's camera PETA took that photographer to court, raising a very complicated question of who actually owns the image, the photographer or the monkey who took the picture, since the animal took the picture, that the case was ultimately settled. But, you know, if, if Happy the, ele the Elephant ultimately is determined to have the same rights as humans, what does that mean about, you know, for other zoo animals? Kind of Precedent? Let yeah. me blow your exactly. mind a minute here. Let, let me blow your mind a minute here. The, the animal rights activists who really want Happy to be considered a person um, may actually be doing themselves a disservice. And I'm not weighing in either way here, but I am saying that if Happy were determined to be a person, then Happy would have to start working for a living. And Happy wouldn't have the benefits of animal welfare and protection either. So they could cut both ways in this case. But mm. it's been decided, there is precedent on this, right? Judges have decided that um, you know, animals could be considered conscious beings and have self-awareness. There's an old test that was administered, uh, and I think Happy was uh, one of the only elephants yes. who passed this test. They put, they, they yes. put them out, they, and then they drew a big dot on their heads, and if they looked in a mirror and then they, they felt it or tried to assess what was on their heads, they were considered conscious beings, and Happy's the only elephant to ever have passed that test. Yeah, that, that now, is... I'm uh, here. I didn't teach a class in college. I have a mere meager Ball State University education. 
But an elephant is an elephant. An elephant is an elephant. A monkey is a monkey. And a human is a human. And if you're going to argue that an animal is a human, then it should go both ways. Right? Then I should be able to show up to work without any clothes on. Fling oh, number wait two. a minute, Hammer. Oh, man. I have to bring down the hammer on that one. That, that is the perfect state? stopping point on that. <laughs> Paddle, I'm sorry. We have run out of time. That is all for News Nation Rush Hour tonight. Hammer, please keep your clothes on. Thank you so much, panel. Ashley, Hammer, Mark, and Capri. Appreciate it. On Balance with Leland Vittert is next. Breaking in just the past few minutes, Title IV.